Welcome back to Ashford Common Baptist Church as Chris continues his series from Nehemiah. So we're going to do Nehemiah. I hope you find this relevant today in chapter five. So uh, Sonia, can you read verses? What, what this is number one? Can you read verses one to uh, five? Um, can um, David read the rest for me? Nehemiah five one. Now there was a great outcry of the people and of their wives against the Jewish king. For there were those who said, with our sons and daughters, we are men. We must get grain so that we may eat and stay alive. <clears throat> there were also those who said, we're having to pledge our fields, our vineyards and our houses in order to get grain during the famine. And there were those who said, we're having to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay the king's tax. Now our flesh is the same as that of our country. Our children are the same as their children. And yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been ravaged. We are powerless and our fields and vineyards belong to others. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these complaints. After thinking it over, I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you're all taking interest from your own people. And I called a great assembly to deal with them and said to them, as far as we are able, we have brought back our Jewish kindred who have been sold to other nations. But now you're selling your own kin who must then be bought back by us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us stop taking of interest. Restore to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the interest on money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been extracting from them. Then they said, we will restore everything and demand nothing more from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them take an oath to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garments and said, so may God shake out everyone from house and from property who does not perform this promise. Thus, may they be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Quite dramatic, isn't it? The problem is very obvious. God's people were working hard to get the wall built. Enemies tried to terrorise them and discourage them. And they all pulled together to, to keep on building and battling if necessary. With Nehemiah's leadership, the external opposition actually strengthened them. So Satan stood back took another approach. He had many, many tricks and, and tools in his bag. Instead of using external opposition, that's near my fall last time, for example, he now tried a more effective approach. Two more we'll look at one next time in chapter six. Internal conflict. Remember in history, the ugliest wars are civil wars. Did you read that? Did you know that? Um, the Americans lost far more people in the Civil War than they did in the Second World War. That, that's amazing, isn't it? 100,000 more died in the Civil Wars. Um, internal fighting and quarrelling is ugly. It's one thing to see a husband yelling at another driver, but when you see a husband yelling at his wife, that's, ooh, wow, isn't it? but far more churches have been destroyed by internal conflict than any number of lawsuits or attacks from the community and, and so on. And yet God's people often get into conflicts amongst themselves. The Israelites under Moses, over and again, they get threatened. You know, they moaned and they groaned. Total mutiny at times. How often are we ready to stone, were they ready to stone Moses, remember? 
The disciples argued amongst themselves the very evening before the arrest and trial of Jesus. What do they argue about? Who's the greatest? Really? Of all things. And that wasn't the first time. On the previous occasion, they'd been working up, walking along, following Jesus. He said, what were you talking about? And they didn't want to admit it. Finally, they said, who's the greatest amongst us? Terrible. Of course, Jesus said, the greatest is really the servant of all. And like the kings of the Gentiles, he says, I am among you as one who serves. That's what's happening in Nehemiah 5. Internal conflict is happening. And it's going to be terrible. So God's people have conflict, and we see it in this chapter. What happened? Times were rushed. Not only were they trying to get the wall built, they're trying to cope with a famine. Taxes were due, and the nobles and the fat cats were ripping their fellow Jews to part by taking advantage of the situation. Four things were happening at the same time. Verse 2, there wasn't enough food for everybody. Notice how the people and their wives are crying out. When mom's not happy, ain't nobody happy. Mothers care about their kids and are quick to do whatever it takes to protect them. Verse three, someone mortgaging their property to get the money to buy food. Verse four, some had to borrow money outright to pay taxes. And verse five, some had to give up their property and were reduced to selling their own children into slavery just to survive. When Nehemiah got hold of this, he didn't get angry. He got very angry. <laughs> and he solved the problem. Okay, so three key lessons from this passage. Lesson one, internal conflict almost always comes from selfishness in one form or another. In this case, it was pure greed. So the nobles and rulers seeing this as an opportunity to minister and serve to the people and show compassion, they selflessly seized it. It's a time to stuff their own accounts with more and more wealth. Yes. But what is greed but another form of selfishness? Selfishness says, I don't care how my actions affect me and that. Who I hurt, I'm in this with just three people, me, myself, and I. Yeah. Let's go for it. You've been there too. Whenever you get angry or irritated or, or you hold bitterness, isn't it because you're thinking about one person, yourself? And when I am, in my own mind, the most important person, not only am I going to have conflict with others, but I'm going to be guilty of idolatry because who am I worshipping? I'm worshipping myself. You all know WWJD? But don't you know what WIIFM is? WIIFM? What's in it for me? Sorry? What's in it for me? Yeah. What's in it for me? Yeah. The famine and the tough times exposed the, great, the greed and the heart, heartlessness and hardness of these rulers' um, hearts. That's what trials and conflicts do. They expose your motives and your wants. So trials can be God-given gifts to help you deal with your own sin and throw out every idol that you cling to and clogs up your heart. Selfishness is a close cousin to pride. These money boys were filled with pride, and that drove their selfishness, that drove the greed. Don't know which comes first, but it doesn't really matter. Almost every conflict is a child of these two monsters of the heart, pride and selfishness. So far, can you read number two? Alternative translations. Uh, arrogance leads to nothing but strife, but wisdom is gained by those who take advice. Too much pride, too much pride causes trouble. Be sensible and take advice. 
So in pride, arrogance, and selfishness, we get upset when others don't treat us in the way we want to be treated. So we gossip and slander others. We refuse to listen to God and humble ourselves and get God's answers. And simple conflict and just keep going on and on, one stop at a time. Therefore, stop it now. It's a very powerful passage from Galatians number three, Eileen. Yes. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you divide, fight and devour one another, Take care, lest you be consumed by one another. Number one, almost all internal conflict is a result of some kind of selfishness and greed. Mm -hmm. Number two, internal conflict can always be resolved when all sides are willing to work it out. And Nehemiah sorts them out, doesn't he? Yeah. That's the blessing of the passage. It doesn't always happen this way, unfortunately. There are times when your adversity refuses to listen, refuses to sit down and work towards a solution. If they will be prepared, then go for it. But in this case, they had a beautiful example of resolution. So let's track back and see what happens. Let's look at Nehemiah especially. Consternation. Nehemiah is very angry. Anger isn't in itself sinful. The Bible says be angry and sin not. Anger isn't wrong. It's what you do with your anger. So that's why it's usually wrong. Every emotion is God-given, and anger is a God-given energy to solve problems, to, to, to make you realise something's wrong and then try to solve it. Listen to the whole section first. But just climbing up and stewing about something doesn't solve the problem. Or going off and exploding doesn't solve the problem either. Nehemiah is angry and it motivates him to solve the problem. So that's just the first step. The second step, consultation. He con consults with himself and God. There are two issues here. He needed to get alone with God, and calm down so that he could think straight. I'm sure he wanted to go over there and execute those loan charts just like that. But more important, he has consulted with God about what's the right thing to do. What's the biblical thing to do? That's number four. Um, Flo, do you want to read number four for me? Thank you. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. The mouth of the wicked will pour down nothing. Beautiful, that kind of language in there. <laughs> Pours out. Some other translations, ponders, as opposed to pouring out evil things, thinking before answering, as opposed to blurting out such evil things. Another translation talks about thinking carefully before speaking, as opposed to overflowing with evil words. You remember your dad, you see a sin, how often have you just poured out volcanic live lava and ash instead of getting a grip and saying, wait a minute, what does God want me to do in this situation? That's another one, WDG, WMD. What does God want me to do in this situation? Confrontation. Wow. Nehemiah confronts the guilty ones. Boy, does he do that. He doesn't go around slandering them to others. He doesn't go off and feel sorry for himself. He doesn't say to himself, I can't believe it. All these problems. And now this God, why did you bring me to help these rascals? I was so easy and I was so happy uh, serving wine to the king. It was such a cushy number. No, he boldly courageously confronts these heavy-duty rich guys. You must not be intimidated by power, wealth, and positions. How many Christian teachers had access to, and Christian leaders have access to President, President Clinton, for example? And how many actually said something with the Holy Spirit's boldness to him? Of course, that goes for all presidents and prime ministers. 
counsel. Notice how Nehemiah appeals to these men. He identifies their first sin first, and that is usury. That's taking interest in, in, that, in the bad manner. So what does the Old Testament say? David can tell us number five. If you lend money to my people, to the, sorry, to my people, to the poor among you, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. You must not exact interest from them. If you do take your neighbor's cloak in pawn, you shall restore it before the sun goes down. For it may be your neighbor's only clothing to use as cover. In what else shall that person sleep? And if your neighbor cries out to me, I will listen, for I am compassionate. And that's compassionate to the fellow Israelites. So God said, you shall not charge them interest. And we talk about 20% plus. We talk about loan charge rather than the bank. Um, and the Old Testament bans that kind of um, taking of interest. That's a sin, he names it. That's exactly what had to happen if it to expect change to take place among God's people. We must be willing to say to God, I'm guilty of greed or whatever you want to fill in the book. But then Nehemiah appeals to several things. He's so good here. He adds persuasiveness to his words, doesn't he? He appeals to their family connection, their love. Appeals to their Israel special uh, status of the people of God. Nehemiah has already redeemed some Jews, bought them back, paid money to get them back from the foreign nations. And here, these greedy rich people were profiting from selling these poor Jews. He appeals to their testimony and witness before the world. This is not good. Your behavior exposes the evil hard heart that we are. And you are letting God down, your testimony before the world, by your evil acts. And then conviction and commitment to change. This doesn't ha always happen, of course, but Christian, husband, wife, brother and sisters, you need to be willing to fear God's word when you've been selfish. You need to be willing to confess that you've been wrong. You need to be willing to commit to change and be held accountable. And you need to be willing to do it. People didn't just say, amen, and go about and change. They did it according to their promise. And, of course, Nehemiah made sure they did that, didn't they? <laughs> sure puts the pressure on that. Nehemiah used an object lesson or parable here. If, if you guys don't follow through, God's going to shake you out. And then, just like <laughs> a dead rat coming out of his... Um, Perhaps. <laughs> okay, where do you stand in the light of all this? Are you involved in the conflict situation? You need to resolve it. You need to take action. Perhaps you're the main cause of it. You've been extremely selfish and proud and you've been arrogant and God is melting your heart right now. Determine before God that as a Christian, you're going to seek forgiveness and do everything God wants you to do until the problem is resolved. But the best section, I think, is lesson three. The integrity of the leader is absolutely essential in helping resolve internal conflict. Nehemiah lived with the fear of the Lord and it governed everything he did. He didn't abuse his position or even use all that he could abuse. He's a leader of amazing integrity. So, Sonia, say something. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor and their leader, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers kept the food allowance of the government. The former governors who were before me made heavy burdens on the people, and took food and wine from them, besides 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people. 
but I did not do so because of the fear of the foe. Indeed, I devoted myself to the work on this ward and acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 people, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations of others. Now that which was prepared for one day was one walk, one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me. And there were 10 days, skins of wine in abundance. Yet with all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the government because of the heavy burden of labor on the people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. This is not self-righteousness and boasting about what he's done. He's simply affirming before the Lord that his goal was not to profit from his position. How rare that is. Or let his pride, uh, let his power swell his pride. He has one goal, that is to please God. You should always just ask, is God pleased when I've done such and such? That's what really matters. Ultimately, it's all that matters. Conflict will happen between Christians. It's almost always stemmed from selfishness in one form or other. It can always be resolved if people are willing. And in conflict, the integrity of the leadership is of paramount importance. And God for Jesus, the glorious redemption, that not only takes us for heaven, that gives us the grace and counsel to live here in this world in a way that pleases him. So instead of using external opposition, Satan often uses a far more effective approach, which is internal conflict. And Nehemiah 4, as well as prayer. Lord, we pray you'll keep us from internal conflict amongst us here and amongst uh, up and with ourselves when we're at work or when we're at home or with our family gatherings, whatever situation, keep us from internal conflict. Keep us repenting of any sin that we know about. Keep us free from greed, selfishness, pride and arrogance and the other terrible sin that surround us and abound in our society. Make us willing to work at all problems involving ourselves so as to resolve the issue. Amen. Amen. Chapter four, external conflict. Chapter five, internal conflict. Chapter six, chop off the head of God's people by destroying the leader. Four vicious attacks on Nehemiah next time in chapter six. And the four different ways. It's a terrible situation. Oh, we've got four leaders, haven't we? <laughs> so pray they all keep their heads um, that Satan doesn't attack them and destroy them and hence destroys our um, Praise God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you found that sermon helpful and would like to join us again on another Sunday. In the meantime, you'll find resources available at our website on YouTube. So please do take the opportunity to have a look, but let's hope to see you soon. God bless you. <laughs>